Our next speaker is John Tangenberg, uh, a GIS analyst uh, for the Council of Watershed Health in California, and he's going to be talking about um, how people move. So let's bring that up, and you're on. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I'm going to tell a story about uh, a process that brought us to modeling pedestrian and bicycle sheds. I work in water area in the water realm, and uh, modeling a watershed is well established. But we were charged with doing a score on parkland in Los Angeles in, within the Arroyo Seco watershed. Um, in the Arroyo Seco, we have some separations. We have the park, the people, and we have the freeway and the flood control channels. And so traditional ways of modeling access to parks and getting a score as to whether the people had access to the parks um, weren't going to work for us in the situation five years ago. The standard ways of doing it then were to create a container and perhaps the park would be in one census block group and the people would be in a different census block group so the people wouldn't have access. Um, obviously buffers, you know, people can't fly over freeways as we talked about earlier. Uh, network analysis um, caused a real problem for us in that we have many different constituents. They all wanted their data in, they wanted the equestrian trail data in, they wanted the bike trail data in, all coming from different layers. We decided to take a process uh, to mock or model pedestrian movement similarly to the way we would model water movement. We decided that a, taking the park and making it the destination and then asking where can people come from across the surface to reach the park as a destination. Very much the way in a watershed you would make a pore point and you would measure where the water could come from within that area. Um, in this example, the dark green is the park, the light green is a pedestrian shed modeled on a surface, and the orange is an example of a buffer um, with the same distance as the pedestrian shed. You see where, the, where connectivity goes through, we get access to the people, and in other places, uh, we allowed straight line distance. Uh, using the surface rather than um, a network or some other um, method allowed us to uh, um, think about the way people actually moved. Now, most of us will see people cutting across streets where there's no crosswalk, crossing park land, crossing open space, crossing parking lots. And in this case, um, we did not constrain people to streets except where there were barriers like flood control channels, bridges, rail, freeways, things like they that they really couldn't get across. We have taken that um, to a recent collaboration between myself, uh, Dr. Brian Hilton at Claremont Graduate University, and architect Carl Welty. We're looking at ways of creating a living building challenge site selection model. Living building challenge says that one of the scores is access, walkable access to transit. This um, sample is from downtown LA. Uh, we have the transit stations, obviously. Uh, this one's Union Station. Um, with network analyst, uh, you can't get people from the transit portal to the actual network because they're separated. There is no network layer that actually goes the pedestrian way through Union Station. Um, so you get a, basically a zero shed there um, using that method. What we decided to do, though, is what we needed to know is where the parcels were that could be developed that would fit the score, uh, where potential building sites would be perceived, or building, actual buildings would be perceived to be within that pedestrian shed. So the dark green is the actual pedestrian shed where there are pedestrian malls people can walk through. Um, they can't walk through the city blocks. Um, they can't walk through the buildings, um, except for Union Station. And uh, we basically then modeled uh, what the building layer was that would be perceived. And we came up with a perception that if the building is basically across the street and visual from that walking distance, that people would say, yes, that's within the walking distance. We took it a little bit farther. Um, and this model is uh, still under construction. Uh, this is a 
model of bicycle access to uh, Claremont High School in Claremont, California. Uh, we have the high school here. Um, again, we used this hybrid model of putting people across the surface. Um, the surface says that you, you know, got to find a way across the freeway that's real. Um, you can go across parkland. This is a park that's right next to the high school. Um, you can cut cross country across there. Um, but major roads, unless they have bike infrastructure on them, have a resistance on them. Um, this comes out of work that was done in Portland and Vancouver, BC, uh, where people were given GPS units to see how they actually used bike infrastructure, how far they were willing to go based on that. We, in this case, uh, randomly gave a 50% resistance. Uh, you can see that, you know, even though this part of this street, Foho Boulevard, um, is a, within the distance, um, the agents or our distance method went around. Um, to get across, find another crossing. Um, through this method, we're af actually able to take in um, many different data sets. We have some small data sets that show where pedestrian pass passageways go over flood control channels. Um, those aren't in any of the network data sets that we've been able to find. They're not in any of the street data sets. And we can put them together very rapidly. Um, and if somebody says, we think you're missing data, we can say, give us the data and put it in. Um, in the list of the, at the beginning of the model and just rerun everything. Um, so I'd like to leave you with a couple thoughts. Um, pedestrians and hikers take the shortest visual route to their destination. Uh, this is documented in multiple ways. Um, it's also a documented way to build trails that you account for the cut-throughs. Um, as, as I was walking from my car, I found uh, the beautiful sidewalks that come through the campus, and sidewalk came this way around a tree, tree, and all the people were going through here, you know, right next to it, creating yet another little thing. Um, college campuses are famous for quads that are crisscrossed by sidewalks where wherever the kids walked, they just put a sidewalk in afterward. Um, cyclists will have different distances and speeds that are perceived as reasonable depending on the aesthetics of the ride. Now, that depends on the person, the aesthetics. Um, new cyclists, young cyclists that are in high school or uh, grade school will want to avoid really busy streets. They don't feel comfortable on them. Um, other long-time cyclists will don't really care. Um, but the model, by using a surface model, you can tune those things really quickly. You can also t use a surface model to tune um, aesthetics like, are you willing or, or do you want to? Would you walk as far next to industrial land use? Um, all of that can be brought in. Um, in my experience doing this, looking at the way people move, um, I don't believe networks capture this. Um, networks are native to computer science, and so it makes it really easy to use them as a model within a computer science setting like GIS. Um, but they don't, people don't actually operate that, in the, that way in the landscape. Thank you.